And we're back. Another edition, Stripe Show Podcast. I'm your host, Travis Fulton. Thank you for making us part of your day. Special edition this week. I've been trying to track this guy down for a while now. He's uh, one of the busiest teachers out there on the PGA Tour, and he uh, he's taking a little time with us here this morning. Coming to us live, TPC San Antonio at the AT&T Oaks Course 2020 PGA Teacher of the Year, Mark Blackburn. Thanks for uh, joining me, Mark. Hey, great to be with you, Travis. How are you, pal? Well, the uh, is the wind blowing yet? That's the first question uh, in Texas, or has it stopped blowing, I should ask? Uh, it's not blowing yet this morning. It's actually pretty overcast uh, right now. There's fog, believe it or not, which is not typically Texas, but I have no doubt if it does what it did yesterday afternoon, it will be blowing. And uh, <laughs> obviously, it's very flat here. We're not in the we were in the hill country last week in Texas with uh, the WGC, but now we're in the. I think this would be a lot flatter. Not many, uh, much elevation, and it the wind howls. So yes, yeah, uh, yeah. Ten to twenty forecast doesn't do it justice, right? Like it, what no. feels like when it says ten, it feels like twenty five there. Yeah, there's just no there's no high trees. So the mm. thing is, there's no shelter from the wind. Like the range here. You, uh, there's a great JW hotel where everybody says it's it's great. Lots of the players bring their families. There's an awesome like water slide and sort of a, mm-hmm. a slot, you know, one of those. I'm trying to think of the name of the thing or the thing. The, the I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, um, mm-hmm. but essentially the range is then sits up on kind of this hill and it's totally exposed. And so it just gets it's just really windy. So premium ball control here. If you look at guys that do well in the wind, who can hit the ball low, good ball strikers. Mm. And that's why the scoring historically hasn't been particularly low, right? Because right. it's just, it's challenging. And so it's a great layout, good golf course. And everybody's obviously pretty keyed up because this is their last stop. If you're not in that field next week in Augusta, Georgia, then this is your last chance to punch your ticket to get to the Masters. Well, you had a guy 2017 at Augusta uh, play well, and then he came over there and won this tournament. That was uh, Kevin Chapel. So you, you know a thing or two about this this golf course and good ball strikers because you have another guy, Charlie Hoffman, who has played well here uh, as well yeah. um, in the past. And that's who I want to start with, Mark, um, is the work that you've done with Charlie Hoffman. I've been watching him, and I just feel like, you know, here's a guy that uh, seems to be kind of trending, trending and, and bubbling up here for a nice run um, this spring and summer. And you look at him statistically, strokes off the tee, he was 111th last year. This year, he's 34th. But the big number that jumps out to me, last year, 296 off the tee. This year, he's about 307. Charlie is getting longer off the tee. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, no, 100%. And that's something as a team that we've focused on. Charlie's super strong. Like, he grew up, as you and I did, in the generation of – it was – if you like a restricted plate on us because golf balls didn't fly straight and equipment didn't wasn't as good as it is now. So the mindset was you're not going to swing at a hundred percent. You're going to swing at about 75, 80% and make sure you put the ball in play. Well, if you look at the way the game's trended, that's completely inverse. Now the technology is so good. I'm a tightless guy. Tightless golf balls are incredible. All right. And so now the driver technology is such that you can swing as hard as you want and the ball's going to go pretty straight. So the off-center hits aren't nearly as penal. And so what that shows is, like, if you've got the ability to generate speed, then you need to use it to be a massive weapon so long as it doesn't sabotage your greens and regulation, right? So mm. strokes gain driving has such a distance bias on it. If you can send the ball down a long way, but you're not in a hazard and you're not out of bounds and you can hit it again, the rough is really irrelevant if you're hitting a lob wedge. You know, some course is dependent. So if you're playing in a U.S. Open and there's a lot of thick rough, then that can be different. But you saw Bryson here at Bay Hill this year. Like, the advantage you have with more loft in your hands where you can produce more spin, that's huge out of a, a difficult lie. So it kind of negates the thing in the fairway. If you're hitting a five iron from the fairway, a lob wedge out the rough, the invariably the guy with the lob wedge out the rough, is going to have as much, if not more, control than the guy with the five iron out of the fairway. And if you just do it over time, there's no way that the guy with the five iron for the course of a season is going to be able to hit it as close as the person right. that's hitting a short iron or a wedge. It's just 
you can do it week the odd week here and there when yeah. it happens and that's why you see it and certain golf courses like Hilton Head where there's not a big distance bias but for the majority of the golf courses it's huge so for Charlie we have a great team working with him it's not just me and so we're like look you've got the ability to do it so it's EPI and Oceanside with Dr. Rose and Lance Gill and Kaylee Franklin we kind of our team or Charlie's team I should say we basically like look you've got all this power and this speed you, you've got to realize that you can send it so we've adjusted his golf swing a little bit we've encouraged him to get longer and if you think about most people as they age Charlie's 43 as we age we lose our range of motion and our mobility so we have to probably make some adjustments in our golf swing to accommodate that so now Charlie's kind of lengthened his back swing he's more unweighted front foot Uh, you got me back now? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so so he has a – so he's basically he's now got more unweighting on the front foot. He's lengthened his swing. He's got a bigger turn. So these are all things that have obviously allowed him to hit the ball further. And now the technology facilitated too is all of a sudden it's like, okay, now he's got another gear. So we've experimented with a longer driver, a 47-inch, and unfortunately he can only hit it straight. Now that sounds quite funny, but – he can get, we've had him up 133 or 134 miles an hour, club head speed, 190, mid 190 ball speeds with that driver. The downfall is Charlie likes to work the ball. He's a really good ball hitter. So he likes to draw it. He likes to fade it. The tough part with these long drivers is they're so long, the vertical swing plane gets you so shallow that it becomes a draw bias club. And if you don't want to play for a big hook, that becomes difficult. So um, it's one of those things where he's, I would say mm -hmm. working more towards swinging faster with a shorter club by changing his swing. But what I will say is when Charlie first came out of the tour, he's one of the longest hitters. Just because he was a good athlete and he was strong, what he hasn't done is he hasn't adapted to the technology Interesting. As, mu as much as, say, other players, but now he has. And so if you look at, say, a Justin Thomas, he's freewheeling, like big, long swing, super efficient, but he's had technology that's facilitated that his whole life. Now, Charlie was, you know, he's a couple of years younger than me. We're playing with ballada balls and wooden heads and things. So the reality is you start swinging hard with that, you can't control your spin, your dispersion is off the charts. So I think for Charlie, we've made him realize, look, you're a good athlete. Mm -hmm. He's very coachable. He wants to, he works very hard. It's like, okay, look, you've got this weapon. Let's, let's utilize it. And then, and from there, we've refined some of his iron game and some of these other pieces. And to be honest, he had some back issues, which he, he has from time to time. But what's happened is by lengthening his swing, getting more into his trail side, some unweighting, all of those things have actually helped his wedge game. We've worked, it's helped his pitching. All of these things have kind of helped him actually move better, feel better. And yeah. if he stays healthy, he's great. That all we're trying to do now is just make sure at 43 you can't play five six weeks in a row like my guy max homer just played eight in a row you can't do that it just just wears you down so we're trying to be selective about when he plays make sure he rests and then you know like you said i think he's trending really nicely he on the last hole last week he uh he made a snowman but besides that he he was just being aggressive off the tee and anyone knows that tee shot there's a lot of uh water and other things but he just didn't putt that well last week so when the when he putts well, his ball striking's great. I think he'll uh, he'll do stuff. So I'm excited to see. And obviously, this is a big year. San Diego U.S. Open is there at Twines. So he's mm. hopefully gets in that. He's trending right now. He should get in the PGA. And he plays well well on hard golf courses. When there's a premium yeah. on good ball striking, and Charlie's doing his thing. He's he's going to be really good. He's going to be up there because he's got great ball control, and that and that's one of the things I think he loves about TPC San Antonio, and <laughs> he uh, has made quite a substantial amount of revenue here. So, and I think he's quite proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the the wind can chew up a lot of players, even the best players, right? You know, when the the premium is on that that strike and and controlling the flight yeah, no, and no. all those things and uh and Charlie's done that guys you look at him statistically mark you know he's he hit the ball good last week at Corrales like he said didn't putt good but the players he was 
he was positive 7.3 stroke gain approach. I mean, that's a huge yeah. number. Um, Arnold Palmer, positive 5.5. Genesis, positive 4.8. I mean, those are, you know, premium numbers on the PGA Tour stroke gain approach, which is certainly a very important uh, statistic. And then you add that length and the ability, as you're saying now, maximizing what he's doing off the tee. That's a nice combination. And, you know, Charlie's going to have his weeks uh, with good putting. So it feels like, you know, things are really bubbling up. I want to ask you this on the distance front. Cause I get this, I get this question a lot. You know, these guys are, they know what Bryson has done, right? There's been an impact. We've seen it. Guys have admitted it. I was shocked when Rory came out and was like, geez, I'm going to, you know, I, I felt the need to try to get longer. Um, we saw it with Jordan speed. He tried to get longer. Give me a couple things as a coach when a player says, look, I want to, I got to get longer, right? I've got to add 10, 12, 15 yards because that's where the game is going. A couple of the the pitfalls that we see, whether it's, in my opinion, like a Rory starts to, in his iron game, you know, he starts to back up a little bit. He's not rotating as well, covering it as well. What are a couple of the pitfalls that you have to be careful with, with a player who says, look, I, man, I've got to crank this thing out there another 15. But like you said, you can't go backwards in greens and regulation and lose the precision, right? The DNA, which got the player there, the geniuses that they all are. Yeah, it's a great question. So when you look at a golf swing, some guys have a V12 engine, but it's tuned like a four cylinder. So when they say to you, hey, I want to hit it further. Well, that's not difficult. That's just tuning what they've already got. The challenging part of the guys that have four cylinder and need a V12 mm. and they're trying to, and then now that becomes problematic. So if you, if you look at a golf swing, say someone like Charlie, Charlie does a really good job of maintaining his dynamic posture. When I say that, not to get overly technical for folks, but if you look at guys that stay in their posture, when you look at their ground forces, they do an amazing job with their trail foot pulls back. This is my trail foot and their lead foot pushes forwards. And that creates a force couple, which creates rotation. The reason that's significant is those are the guys where their tailbone goes backwards and they create space when they come into impact. If those guys want to go harder, that's not difficult because they have the right firing mechanism. So when they go harder, they rotate harder. That's a good thing. You add a little bit of more unweighting, a little bit more vertical, but they have the right amount of push with their lead leg to send them around the corner. Now, here's the downfall. The guys invariably that want to add speed don't have that. They tend to have a little bit more linear motion, more horizontal push. The trail leg pushes them down the target line. And then they're the guys that get this tilt and this side bend, and then they can't rotate. So they try and go harder, but they go harder in this manner. And now all of a sudden they shift the path out to the right. The face opens up. It's a block. Or then because they're so good, they flip the face. So now that becomes problematic because the engine and the inherent, if you like, power system that they have, isn't conducive they don't they're missing that massive we call it anterior push so the anterior pushing forwards to so backwards they don't have that and so inherently if that's not how they're wired when they ask to go for more distance now you have to be really careful because they're going to go harder in the pattern that they're used to and that pattern sometimes leads to instability and a loss of dynamic posture now the shaft gets under the plane now they get out to the right so it's one of those things where a lot of it starts in the gym. If someone wants to go faster, you have to give them a bigger engine to start with, right? And so that starts in the gym and organically you're trying to develop it so that they get these movement patterns down. So when you put a golf club in their hand, now all of a sudden it's kind of semi-subconscious when they're trying to do it. The downfall is these guys that what makes them all so good and there's so many different patterns out here, but what makes them great is these things. And if you put their body in a completely different position coming into the ball, their mechanism to square the club face is completely foreign to them. And now all of a sudden we have big problems. So that's where you have to be careful. And mm -hmm. if you look, the guys that have been successful adding distance, if you look someone like a Justin Rose, he, he wanted to get to 300 yards carry. He did it with his team over time. And obviously that was a, a really successful project. Well, unfortunately now 300 is not, you need probably 310 or 315. So again, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's, but it's, it's one of those things where when you chase the speed, getting speed is not difficult. 
It's physics. It's really simple, right? It's just increasing your angular momentum. There's when you start to get to that, you get rid of all these sort of old wise tales and you measure stuff objectively with 3D capture and motion plates and you've got launch monitor data. Getting someone to swing faster is not difficult. Now, what is difficult is to make that usable and can they control the strike? That's where it becomes really difficult. And so that's where the, the artistic part of the coaching comes in. And as much as you're trying to help your players, you also need to protect them. And sometimes the opportunity cost of adding the distance isn't worth what they're going to lose. The net is just not worth it. So again, that's when you have to be selective to be, okay, you need to work on maintaining what you've got and then get even better at your wedge game and your approach game and your putting and your tactical strategic decisions. But we're in the, I would say, we're in a changing of the guard. If you look at what's coming, the guys that are coming out and the girls, bigger, faster, stronger, more speed, more distance, we need to embrace that and realize that's the way the game's going and people are going to enjoy watching that. We can change yeah. golf courses with agronomy to offset that. We don't need a rollback because then we get rid of the thing that makes golf so great is that your listeners can go buy the same product, the same equipment, golf balls, everything as Tony Finau or Tiger Woods or Max Homer or Charlie Hoffman or Ches Reeve or Adam Hadwin and they can go play the same golf courses. If we lose that, now we have two different games. It's not, I don't think it's going to be the same. I agree. Yeah, yeah. That's that's well said. I agree. And that's a question that I get a lot, you know, with, with my listeners here and my followers is, you know, the, gosh, the, the, you would think they would all want to get longer, but there's a risk, right? There's a risk there. Let me ask you this, in your opinion, how big of a risk do you say like a player like a Bryson took? with his body and his swing. I mean, a lot of things that he changed yep. to go after what is now probably 35, 40 yards yep. and to pull it off. How big of a risk is that for a player of, of his level? Yeah, no, I think it's obviously a huge risk, but I think great players and great athletes are risk takers. They want to get better. They're willing to raise the bar to push it. They're not afraid, afraid of failure. And failure is not, I mean, failure first attempt in learning right mm. you don't learn from successes you learn from your failures and I think Bryson was like look there's an opportunity here to get a big advantage which is out there anyone can do it but are you willing to be disciplined enough to do it like I said it's not that difficult to add distance it's not that difficult to add mass and size but are you disciplined mm. enough to do it and stick to the process and the plan that you have so kudos to Bryson he took a huge risk but I think it was an educated risk. And I think he understood that I'm willing to, you know, fail if I'm not successful. And he was still a great player. So, and obviously he's got a great team with Como, Mike Shy, yep. and those guys. And in Bryson's, the one thing that people sort of fail to realize too is Bryson's improved his putting beyond belief. Yeah. Yeah. He is one of the best putters on the tour. And when he won the Open, yeah, he was smashing it. But if you actually look, he put putted and scrambled and, and played great. So Bryson's a hell of a player. Like he, I give him full credit and he's done the same things. Ty, Tiger changed his swing how many times? Three, four times to try and get better. He didn't do it to try and get worse. He did it because he wanted to improve. So again, the best players are willing to take the biggest risks, I think. And that's the risk reward scenario that makes them great. And yeah. that's why we admire them so much. You know, it's uh, obviously the distance has happened with Charlie and he's been able to, as you said, maintain the, you know, the, the awareness here in the face. I mean, stroke scan approach last year, at 55th this year, he's 18th. So he's at a distance. He's got precision um, in the iron game. I want to switch gears here real quick. Go to another player, Max Homa guy you've been working with now. How long Mark for, with Max? We started at the, he missed the cut at wing foot. I was there. We were both there for a Titleist photo shoot and um, on the Monday afterwards. And then Joe Griner, his caddy, who used to caddy yeah. for Chat Chappie, said, hey, yep. Max is struggling. Would you do me a favor and kind of help him? And so I screened him, looked at his body, and then kind of we worked for a couple of days. And um, that's kind of how it started. And it was not yeah. anything formal initially. And then we kind of committed fully the week before Mexico. He came out to Birmingham and spent a couple of days with me. So 
yeah, it's been, it's been great. Obviously, he's a super talented kid. I, we just tried to match his golf swing to his body a little bit and give him something that physically he could do. So he's a he's a superstar for sure. Yeah, he's he's really turned it on. Um, you've helped him a, a great deal. Gosh, you look at him first part of the year here and his finishes. Um, gosh, you know, seventh at the AT and T, and then of course he he wins the Genesis, just absolute bulldog down the stretch. Um, you know, at the Genesis, twenty second at WGC, tenth at Arnold Palmer. So Max Homa has inserted himself now into you know the conversation on on, on a regular basis. It seems now on the PGA Tour and if you had to share with us one thing that you, I mean, I know there's always, there's a lot of things, right? You're always looking at a lot of things, but like in layman's terms for the listeners, you had to say, gosh, you know, Max Homa has really improved this to help him now propel and play the kind of golf he has in 2021. Yeah. I'd say his lead arm position at the top of the back swing. So Max, struggles with what we'd call shoulder flexion so your ability to get your arms above your head so he was trying to have this big high backswing and so then what happened is tailbone would come in and he'd lose his posture so what we've worked on is to try and get him to where his lead arm is more parallel to his shoulder plane just because okay. that's what matches his range of motion it gets a little above and he's got more depth more turn going this way so now he can rotate in his posture and obviously his wedge games improved dramatically his irons and his ball striking and all we tried to do is match his golf swing to his body nothing mm -hmm. more than that and um that's just because although he's very lean and long he doesn't have great shoulder flexion so we just accommodated it so now he's a lot more rotary i would say he's lost some of the slide back up and flip and yeah you know, that, 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 for the layman's terms, I would tell everybody, try and find a way to swing the club that accommodates what you can do. And that's what, you know, I've been doing that for the last 20 years. It's one of those things. That's what, it's a long-term approach. There's always going to be styles and trends that are really popular. But the reality is not everybody can do that. You want to stay healthy. The goal being, how do you try and protect players as best you can and then you're going to make mistakes and you're going to try things and everybody's body is unique i will say this and so what works for one person may not work for another person and so it's mm. a case by case basis you're trying to chip away at it but i'm always i say i'm trying to stack the deck in the player's favor and so for the average golfer stack the deck in your favor by finding a coach or a teacher that can help you build a golf swing around what you can do what shot you want to hit and then how you move. And then from there, you're going to have a lot more success. But if you're trying to do something that physically is a challenge for you, you're going to have error and you're going to have a really hard time being consistent. And I think that's the part that people forget that yeah. you've got to try and do what's best for you, not what is best for everybody else. Let me, let me ask you this here. Talk about these, the feet again, real quick, as you're going to, here's my right foot, left foot. Yep. And you like you look at Max Homa, you look at um, you look at Hoffman, and, and you look at how their trail foot kind of works through the impact. Let's just take like a little approach wedge shot, you know, yeah, a little three quarter approach wedge. I think it was Max a lot. His trail foot kind of you know it's kind of almost like a little down. Or we got here we go, a little kind of yeah. down through the instep kind of thing, you know. Yeah, invert, you see some, you yeah. See, yeah, yeah, invert. So you see some trail foot kind of dig this way, and then obviously like then some kind of pop up right like a JT. I see, you know, Max and Char like down through the instep, and then sometimes they just kind of hang out there. You know, the kind of foot kind of hangs out there as they just turn through. Spine extends a little bit. What do you prefer? Do you do you like that trail foot action? I know everybody's a little different, but a little on, invert on a, versus yeah, popping up. That's a great question. So I would tell you that everybody's unique, right? Um, and so force precedes motion. So if you apply a force at some point, then a motion is created. Does that make sense? Like something will, Yeah. if I apply a force with my foot, then in, afterwards there's going to be a reaction and then I'm going to have a motion. So I would say this, when we play golf, we want to turn on an inclination, right? So anything that accommodates your pelvis and your torso being on inclination is advantageous. Now, some guys have naturally a nice tilt to their pelvis so that or side bend so their pelvis is on an angle so now as they come into the ball the club's coming on an angle if those guys naturally do that i don't really care if their trail foot's up on its toe plantar flex a lot because their hips in the right position 
Now, if you're a guy that struggles to get enough side bend with your pelvis and your trail side runs high, I definitely advocate you do well to bank that trail foot or roll the instep in so that you can get the, the, the club working. Now, some guys, inversion and eversion is your feet working like this. Some people struggle with that and have really, mm -hmm. I would say, tight ankles. Is yeah. they, they don't have great mobility. Those are the guys a lot of times where you see a lot of this plantar dorsiflexion. There's not much rolling and banking. So again, when you look at the feet, I wouldn't say I have a preference. I just want it to match what that player does everywhere else. And that's the part when you, when you look at the best ball hitters, generally speaking, they're in their posture, their trail arm, you know, is kind of got some bend in it. The club's leaning forwards. They're in a position to where they, they're controlling the hit and their body's opening up. That's very much facilitated with good foot action and a good knee action and all those other things. And I would say, the average golf would probably do better to have their foot banking slightly as long as it they don't overdo it. The problem with the average yeah. golfer, they overdo stuff and now they've got a knee injury on the medium yeah. side and you're like, what on earth happened here? So yeah. I would say preference to that. I'm more about when I measure at the feet. Hopefully I'll come back. Yeah, you're there. Yep. Okay. How well do they, you know, use what they're doing into the ground? And sometimes I don't care about the stylistic part of it. If it matches yeah. the other pieces, I talk about their swings, a recipe and the ingredients. Mm -hmm. If it matches what they're doing and they have given outcome, it's fine. And if you line up the best players in the world over time, look at um, Scotty Scheffler. Well, his foot does. That's great. Look at Patrick Reed. Look at people. They're, they're generally, they're doing things for a reason. Yeah. Sometimes those idiosyncrasies, you actually get rid of those. You make people worse. And so I always say, look, why measure? Why guess what you can measure? Measure something, and then, okay, you can do that, or you know, it might be easier if you don't do that. That's the hardest part, I think. With experience comes wisdom, and you're like, does it? Is it really doing anything, or is it just a style preference? And I would say I've become way less style orientated over time. Yeah. And way more to what you're looking at, these strokes gained approaches and strokes yeah. gained off the tee and like statistic benchmarking where objectively it's like, well, either you're efficient at it or you're not. If it's really efficient and it looks awful, we're probably not going to change it. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. All right, a couple quick hitters here and then I'll let you go. So we're going to think about the amateur perception, the amateur golfer, okay, his perception yeah. of how or what a PGA Tour player is doing. Okay, so the first one is a PGA Tour player, when they hit an approach wedge, they hit it at a lower trajectory or higher trajectory than what you think the amateur perception is. Way lower. So the peak height is going to be somewhere between 40. At some, sometimes I've seen guys hitting them in at 45, 50 feet. 60 to 70 feet, but the peak height's not very high at all. Okay. The, la the launch is really low, good wedge players. So the environment that you want for a wedge is low launch, high spin. So you need to deliver less dynamic loft. So you create this environment for high spin. It's the opposite of a driver. Driver's high launch, low spin, right? So with a wedge, good wedge players are launching like a 60 degree wedge. The ones that really thump it, it comes yeah. out launch is probably 24 25 degrees that's on a 60 degree wedge so think about how much <laughs> yeah. dynamic how much shaftling you're talking 15 to 18 degrees of shaftling for some guys that's a grip length of shaftling but without sticking the club in the turf so their wedge game especially courses like this that launch angle and their ability to hit the wedges is just a totally different phenomenon most wedge club golfers hit them up in the air and that's just not very durable in environment conditions, and it's not spinning much. Whereas a tour player, it sounds like a gun's going off. Yeah. It comes out really low, and then it just goes dun dun. And that's the part that uh, I think people are misconstrued. You watch guys in pro ams, you know, and my guy might hit one and it comes out. And I'm like, that's way too high. I hit another one, and people are like, oh, that was really good. And then they see this one come out, and they're like, wow. And then the ball just so controlled yeah. so i think yeah that's the biggest difference that people have no concept on is that 
they, they come, they're good, good wedge players, low launch, high spin, you know, someone like a Duffner. Yeah. Those guys, Charlie's good at it. Chap is actually good at it. Yeah. Zach, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And they develop that over time, right? Yeah. If you go back over, over history, you look at someone like a Trevino, his wedge is more off his back foot and he's leaning the shaft forwards with all the shaft lean. And he's like, he always used to kind of shake the club and go, man, that ball's sticking to the club face. Well, that's yeah. because he's got that environment. What's well, what good wedge players do? That is not what you do to hit a Rory McIlroy 155-foot three iron, though. Very different. <laughs> but again, that's why you look at horses for courses. Yeah. That's why the guys that drive it generally, generally, drive it great, hit big high sweep in draws, not the best short iron and wedge, iron, wedge players because the dynamic loft management and the club exit and these other things aren't the same. So again, it's like, What's the yeah. DNA of how you play the game? What courses are you going to play? Yada, yada, yada. Yeah. All right. Next one. Tour players, strategy standpoint, are going at the flag stick pretty much most of the time. False. False. Out of 18, yeah. on average, I know every course is different. Every player is different. What would you say? Like, what's the green light at the flag out of 18? What do you think on average? How many times would they like, yeah, let's green light, let's go? Well, first off, it has to be the right number. The number. Then the, then the pin has to be in the right location. What's the opportunity cost? You know, obviously, in a perfect world, you'd be playing uphill every single time. You'd rather have a uphill 20-footer than a, you know, six-footer that's side hill breaking off the chart. So that's a strategic standpoint. So sometimes a good shot might be – below the hole so you're putting uphill which may not look like you're firing at the pin but that's going to give you the best opportunity to make the putt so again i think those are some of the things i'd say if it's a short club a wedge or dead, then sometimes they're going to take dead aim some i would say it's probably not more than 33 percent of the time like i and that's probably a rough that's probably yeah. not that accurate to be honest um just because think about scoring scoring is the compounding of marginal small gains over time so if you 180 yards in the fairway and you hit it on the green and two part on the pga tour your strokes gain positive well if you it's the marginal those small marginal gains on every single hole cumulatively over 72 holes which lead to you know a positive six or seven strokes gain pro right here's the thing if you are now taking on more risk and you're trying shots which you might have to, let's say, on the last hole to get into a playoff, that's not going to be the same as you going along trying to optimize your scoring because the margin of error and risk is far more. So it's all about being disciplined and managing the risk. And I would say they're not aiming at flags nearly as much as you think they are. If they have the perfect number, the wind direction's great, there's not short-sighted issue, the stars line up, yeah, they're going to go for it. Yeah. But a lot of times they might pull or push a ball to the hole by mistake instead mm. of actually flagging it. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. So I think that, I think that's the part that scoring, I tell everybody, right? All my juniors, the golfers I'm trying to coach not on the mini tours and then scoring is an art form. You need to learn to score and the best players know how to do it a lot of time from experience and it's trying to know when you can go, when you need to stay. It's a bit like playing poker. And yep. so it, again, depends on what you're comfortable with. That's that's another big part of it. And everybody's different. Some people are risk averse. I got players I coach who are risk averse. The problem you got with that is that's not going to capitalize on their scoring potential. And then you got mm. some people who are so aggressive that they're sabotaging their scoring potential because they just do stupid shit. Right. So it's, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. it's again trying to it's trying to know how to be disciplined when to attack. But the average golfer thinks that they're just firing at the flags. A good no. shot. Look at if you have it right there, what's the proximity from 170 yards on the PGA tour? If you pull that up, that's yeah. gonna tell you how good a good shot is. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's the yeah, we have this conversation all the time. Like they're not they're not taking dead aim. They're they're way more conservative than you think. Way yeah, more conservative. When, and when people talk about just take dead aim, aim small, miss ball, those are conservative targets, but they're making really aggressive swings to them because yeah. it's like you're, you're trying to plot your way around the golf course to give yourself opportunities. And again, it's a bit like 
playing craps at the casino. You have a system. Sometimes it's going to be good. Sometimes it's not. But you don't yeah. sabotage the system. You just try and always put the, the odds in your favor. Yeah. Let me ask you this final question. You know, as much as I was happy to see Max Homa win uh, for you and, and obviously Chap out there playing and Charlie, I think the win by Mike Weir that's coming this year, um, I'm going to predict on the Champions Tour would be really cool. He's one of the real good guys in golf. Um, I mean, he has lived it, done it, grinder, you know, um, master's champ, just always loved watching him play, you know, and now he's on the champions tour and he's off to, you know, a great start this year, seventh and Mitsubishi tied for second, at color guard, a win's coming this year for Mike. Weir on the champions tour. Am I, am I crazy? No, you're hundred percent right. I just spent, um, three days with Weezy last week, uh, before I went to Palm Springs, I was with Weezy, um, and his game's great. We're at the Vintage Club with David Woods, who's hosting us. Yeah. And I know it's, it's a his game is in a great spot. The coolest thing about Mike, he's obviously been through the grinder. He's come out the other side, and he just he wants to get better, and he works so hard. Yeah. He works like a guy on the on the regular tour. We got a great team of people behind him. Um, his trainer, his Cairo, all his movement specialists. Like he's in a great spot. Um. It's one of those things where, yeah, I believe he's going to win. I'm hoping that he does the business in Birmingham. We host a tournament, the tradition of Greystone. So that would be really fitting if that was the one that he won at. That would be incredible. Um, so we'll see. But he's definitely doing all the right things. And you can tell, you talked about this and Charlie you alluded to it. People are trending, right? Players are either going up or down. Yeah. If you're not going up, you're kind of regressing. And so you just got to keep chugging away at it and – giving yourself opportunities. The best thing on the Champions Tour is Mike's a young guy amongst old guys, right? <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, the, yeah. he's the rookie yeah. who wants it, who's chasing it, who's, you know, outworking guys. So it's, again, it's different. So he's, he's motivated and there's no cut. That's the other thing. Like, you know yeah. you're going to play, so you're a little more patient. You're never really out of it. So and it's it capitalizes on all the good things. Like, he drives the ball great now. If you look at his stats. And his wedge game is still incredible. And he actually, yeah. in a, where he finished second in uh, Tucson, his ball hitting was incredible. And he just didn't chip and putt like Mike on the last day. And so we kind of, that's some of the stuff we worked on uh, last week in, out in Palm Springs. And yeah. when those things line up, it's like he's, he's going to play great. But he's a great yeah. competitor. Excited to go to Augusta with him. Um, I've seen him on Sunday there. So, yeah, it's great. I mean, he's he's – He's a lovely man, yeah. and it's so nice to see such a, a guy that's been through it come out the other side. And that's the thing with golf, right? It's a lifelong game. Don't give up. The game's going to take it from you, and it's going to give it to you, so whether you're able to sustain for the duration. Yeah, that's right. That's right, and he and he has. And I got a lot of respect for that. I was up in Savannah, I think the Corn Ferry Tour a couple years ago, and I was standing there, and here he comes up in the practice round hitting a shot, and I just – you know, it's like, man, I got a lot of respect for that guy. I love the guy when he was on the PGA tour and winning and, you know, get him to 50, yeah. get him to the PGA tour champions and let him go, you know, because he's going to do really well out there, which he has great start to the season. I think he wins this year. Why don't you just go ahead and clip off another win with, um, I don't know, let's have Charlie win again this year, I guess, since I've got a win ticket that'd on be, him. So <laughs> that would be great. Charlie, Charlie, <laughs> definitely, definitely <laughs> trending. He's, he's doing, the right stuff. So, yeah. you know, it's he one is. of those things. He's, guys are guys are all playing pretty good. So it's yeah. one of those things. I'm fortunate to work with them. Um, it's you're just a little part of their journey, and they're the ones doing it, hitting all the shots. You just hope that you can help them just a little bit. Yeah. Well, you are, buddy. I appreciate it. And um, congrats on all the success. Thank you for uh, taking some time. I, I, I really appreciate it. Of course. Anytime. I'm sorry if it cut out a couple of times. No, Richard, fine. Richard phone goes on and off, but um, I know you're a busy, recording. man. It's probably <laughs> probably another player saying, "Mark, get off the phone and get out here and help me." <laughs> yeah, probably. So, but okay, I appreciate buddy. it. Thanks yep. for all you do. Be safe. Right. See you, okay. man. Yep. Bye. See ya. Yep.